Section 1. Introduction. We've seen that some Dedekind domains are unique factorization domains, meaning that all of their ideals are principal, and some aren't, meaning that they have non-principal ideals too. In this video, we're going to refine this notion a bit, and we're going to ask the question, given a Dedekind domain R, how far is it from being a unique factorization domain? At the end of last video, I drew a conjectured ideal multiplication table. Inside a unique factorization domain, it just looks like this. There are only principal ideals, which act basically like numbers, and when you multiply two principal ideals, you get a principal ideal. Inside a non-unique factorization domain, the story is more complicated. Three boxes of this multiplication table are easy to fill in, but what about the fourth? Well, here are two examples. Example 1. In the ring Z adjoin root minus 5, the square of the ideal 3, 1 plus root minus 5 is the ideal 2 minus root minus 5. So this is an example of a non-principal ideal times a non-principal ideal, which equals a principal ideal. Example 2. In the ring Z adjoin root minus 23, the square of the ideal 3, 1 plus root minus 23 is the ideal 9, comma, minus 1 plus 5 root minus 23. And there's no way to write this with just a single generator. So this is an example of a non-principal ideal times a non-principal ideal, which is still non-principal. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to lump together all the principal ideals into a single category, a single class. And in a unique factorization domain, that's going to be all there is. There's only going to be one class of ideals, the class of principal ideals. Now, if you're not in a unique factorization domain, but the product of two non-principal ideals is always principal, like in example one, then there are two ideal classes, principal and non-principal. If you like, this means that half the ideals in your ring are principal and half are non-principal. On the other hand, if the product of two non-principal ideals is again sometimes non-principal, like in example two, then we're going to have to try to put our ideals into more than two classes in order to end up with a proper multiplication table here. In fact, ideal classes will always form a group under multiplication. I won't assume you know any group theory here, but it's a fact for those of you who do. By the way, one final pedantic note. Throughout this video, I'm just going to ignore the zero ideal, because it's an exception to basically everything I'm about to say here, and I don't want to have to mention it every time, so here's your blanket warning. Section 2. Ideals, Lattices, and Norms. Here are some pictures of ideals we've seen before, and for good measure, here's the ideal generated by... 3 inside z-omega, where omega is a complex cube root of 1. You might have noticed a very regular repeating pattern in all of these pictures. Just like our additive pictures of our rings form lattices, non-zero ideals inside these rings form sub-lattices. They may be rotated, they may be stretched in various directions, but they're always subsets of the ring, and they're always structurally of kind of a similar shape. We've talked about norms of elements before. Now I'm going to define something called the norm of an ideal. That's going to be the scale factor by which the volume or area enclosed by the lattice changes as you stretch the ring out to form the ideal. So for example, example one, the ideal 2z of z. As you stretch z out to get 2z, you've stretched horizontally by a factor of 2. So the norm of 2z is that scale factor 2. Example 2. The ideal 3zi of zi. Well, as you stretch out zi to get 3zi, you have to stretch by a factor of 3 horizontally and by a factor of 3 vertically. That is, the area of one of these unit squares here has gone up by a factor of 9. So the norm of 3zi is 9. Example 3. The ideal 3, 1 plus root minus 5 in z root minus 5. 
As you can see, we have to skew it slightly. That's fine. And then we have to stretch vertically by a factor of three. So the area of a unit square has gone up by a factor of three. It's turned into a parallelogram. So the norm of this ideal is three. If you remember, this is consistent with what we hoped it would be a couple of videos ago. I'm going to call these rotated and stretched unit squares fundamental cells of the lattices. Notice that all the fundamental cells kind of look the same. They're just moved around a bit. Now, as norms are just scale factors, they're still multiplicative, just like the element norm was. So the norm of i times j is the norm of i times the norm of j, if i and j are two ideals in your ring. In fact, if alpha is an element of your ring, then the norm of the principal ideal generated by alpha is just the absolute value of the norm of the element alpha. Don't forget that sometimes elements can have negative norm and ideals can't, but otherwise these are the same concept on principal ideals. Here's another perspective that will actually be more useful later. Let me take one of these fundamental cells and shift it very slightly so that there are no lattice points on the boundary. The norm of an ideal is then the number of lattice points inside this region here. If you know what the quotient of a ring R by an ideal I is, then you can define the norm of I to be the size of R mod I. If you don't, don't worry about it for now. Section 3. Fractional ideals. The ideals we've talked about so far are sometimes called integral ideals. Maybe I'll say why some other time. But let's just take it on faith for now that these have something to do with integers. Well, it's sometimes helpful to step outside the world of integers into the world of fractions. And that's what we're going to do now. If integral ideals are certain sub-lattices obtained by stretching, then a fractional ideal is, roughly speaking, a lattice obtained by stretching or squashing. Here's something closer to a formal definition. Let's suppose we have a nice ring R. I'll say more about what I mean by nice some other time. Certainly a Dedekind domain, and you might as well assume it's sitting inside the complex numbers. Then, a fractional ideal is a subset I of the complex numbers, not necessarily of the ring, but of the complex numbers, such that whenever you add two elements of i, you get another element of i. And whenever you multiply an element of i by an element of the ring, you end up back in i. So far, very similar to what we had before. And the third condition is, there exists some non-zero element x in r, such that when you multiply the whole ideal by x, the whole thing ends up inside the ring. You can think of i as living somewhere in 1 over x times r. So x is a kind of denominator, and multiplying through by x is going to clear all the denominators. Notice, by the way, that all integral ideals are also fractional ideals. You can just take that denominator to be 1. All right, here are a couple of examples of non-integral fractional ideals. Hopefully, it'll become clear what I mean by fractional. Example 1. A half times z is a fractional ideal of z. It looks like this. Multiplying any element here by 2 is going to give you an integer. Example 2. 1 third times zi. Same story here. The denominator is 3. I'm going to tentatively define something called the inverse of a fractional ideal. If i is a fractional ideal, its inverse, i to the power of minus 1, is the set of all complex numbers x, such that x times i is a subset of the ring r. So for example, you can work out that the inverse of a half z is 2z. The inverse of 5zi is 1 -fifth zi. Now the reason this is tentative is that even though we've called these things fractions and inverses, it's not completely obvious from their definition that they behave in the way you'd expect. What we want is, for instance, that if i is an integral ideal, then i times i inverse should equal whatever the ideal equivalent of 1 is. 
So that is the ideal generated by one, which is just the whole ring. Luckily, in a Dedekind domain, this turns out to always be true. So we really do have a working notion of fractions here as well. By the way, because the ideal norm is multiplicative, it does behave how you expect it to on fractional ideals. That is, the norm of I inverse is just 1 over the norm of I. Section 4. Rescaling Ideals Here's an important trick that we're going to use several times over the next few videos. Let's fix some ring R, and suppose we know that for any non-zero integral ideal J, there exists some non-zero element alpha in J, such that mod the norm of alpha divided by the norm of J is at most K for some number K. The ideal rescaling lemma says the following. Given any non-zero integral ideal i, there exists a non-zero integral ideal k in the same ideal class as i, with the norm of k at most k. Okay. This tells us that if we want to know something about all ideal classes, we don't need to check all ideals, we only need to check integral ideals of small norm. Here's a proof. Consider the inverse of i. This is a fractional ideal, which means that I can clear denominators to get an integral ideal j. I've just multiplied i inverse by a number, so i inverse and j are in the same class. Now, let alpha be that element mentioned above. Then j contains the element alpha, which is the same as saying that j divides the ideal generated by alpha. So, if i invert j, I can clear the denominators by multiplying by alpha. Let k be this new ideal, alpha times j inverse. Then the norm of k is the absolute value of the norm of alpha times the norm of j inverse, which is at most k, as we assumed. But as my diagram suggests, k and i are actually in the same class. After all, k is a multiple of the inverse of j, which is a multiple of the inverse of i. So apart from multiplying by some ring elements, we've just taken inverses twice. So k and i are just multiples of each other. I'm stating this explicitly now because this is going to come up over and over again. Section 5. Ideal Classes Remember at the start I said I wanted to put all the principal ideals together into a single class. I'm going to deal with fractional ideals rather than integral ideals just because it will be a bit more convenient. My classification will be as follows. Let's fix a ring R. Two of its ideals, say i and j, are going to be in the same class, which I'll write using this twiddle symbol, if there exist non-zero elements, alpha and beta, in R, such that alpha times i equals beta times j. In other words, by multiplying by non-zero elements of the ring, I can turn i and j into the same thing, the same lattice. So for example, the ideals a half z and 3z are in the same class because I can multiply the first one by 6 and the second one by 1, and they end up being equal. Now, a principal ideal is just what happens when you take the ring and you multiply it by an element. So all principal ideals are in the same class. If x and y are in your ring R, then the ideal generated by x and the ideal generated by y are in the same class because I can multiply the first by y and the second by x, and they both become equal. If x and y aren't in the ring, so we have fractional ideals, then you'll need to clear the denominators too, but that's it. On the other hand, if you multiply a principal ideal by an element, it stays principal, and if you multiply a non-principal ideal by an element, it stays non-principal. So principal and non-principal ideals always live in different classes. As we saw at the start, though, there's no guarantee that all the non-principal ideals are going to live in the same class. So our ideal multiplication table is eventually going to look like this. It'll have a class, say C1, of principal ideals, and then maybe a whole bunch of classes, C2 up to CH, of non-principal ideals. This H 
is called the ideal class number of the ring, and it's our measurement of how far we are from being a unique factorization domain. Actually, I should admit, I've assumed here that there are only finitely many classes, but I haven't proved it yet. At least, at this stage, H could be infinite. We'll come back to that in a later video. Also, I won't spell out all the details explicitly, but at this point, we do have all the information necessary to know that ideal classes form an abelian group. That's quite easy to check if you know what abelian groups are. The principal class is the identity element, and you can find the inverse of a class by just taking any fractional ideal in that class, taking its inverse fractional ideal, and taking the class of that. Everything else you need to check follows from properties of complex numbers. In particular, even if you don't know what an abelian group is, this applies that our multiplication table will be well defined. Each row and each column will contain one of each class, sort of Sudoku style. So if h equals 1, in other words, we're in a unique factorization domain, then it's going to look like this. If h equals 2, this lower right entry in the table had better be the class C1 of principal ideals. If h equals 3, there's also only one way of filling in this table. For larger values of h, there can be more than one possible way of filling in this table, but we do always get a table like this. Section 6. An example. We know already that z join root minus 5 has some non-principal ideals. So it contains at least two ideal classes, principal and non-principal, but we don't know how many. I'm going to prove that there are actually only two. The proof has two stages. In the first stage, I'm going to use what we learned in the previous video to write down all the integral ideals with small norm. Let's say norm at most six. And I'm just going to check by hand which ones are in the same class as each other. And then in the second stage, I'm going to use a clever geometric trick to prove that every ideal class contains at least one of these ideals of norm at most 6. So, stage 1. I want all the ideals of norm at most 6, so norm 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. I know there's one prime ideal of norm 2, and there are two prime ideals of norm 3, and there's one prime ideal of norm 5. And I know that every ideal is a product of primes, so I can work out the rest. So here are my ideals. We've seen all these ideals before. Most of them are principal, so they're all going to go in one class. What about the rest? Well, P2 is non-principal, so it must go in a different class. What else is in the same class as P2? Is P3 in there as well? Well, yes. If you multiply P2 by 1 plus root minus 5, that's the same thing as if you multiply p3 by 2. You can check that. What about p3 bar? Yes, for similar reasons. So, every class that contains an integral ideal of norm at most 6 must be one of these two classes. Now, here's the trick. Stage 2. Let j be any integral ideal. I'm going to show that it contains a non-zero element, alpha, such that the norm of alpha over the norm of j is at most 6, then will be done by the ideal rescaling lemma. The norm of j is just some number, so we can pick the integer m such that m squared is less than or equal to the norm of j, which is less than m plus 1 squared. Now remember that the norm of j was the number of points inside any fundamental cell of the lattice. This is less than m plus 1 squared, so if I have any m plus 1 squared elements in the ring, two of them must be the same point in different cells. So the difference between them must be a lattice point, an element of j. So, let's take the following elements. Let's take a plus b root minus 5, where a can be anywhere between 0 and m, and b can be anywhere between 0 and m count them, there are m plus 1 squared of these. So, there must be two of them that occupy the same point in different cells. Subtracting them gives me a non-zero element of j. Let's call it alpha, which is, say, 
c plus d root minus 5. Then the norm of alpha is c squared plus 5d squared, which is at most m squared plus 5m squared, which is 6m squared. Right, the norm of j is at least m squared. The norm of alpha is at most 6m squared. So the norm of alpha divided by the norm of j is at most 6. And we're done. Section 7, returning to our previous problem. Last video, we tried to show that the equation y cubed equals x squared plus 5 had no integer solutions. We factorized this equation into a product of ideals of z adjoin root minus 5, and we applied the ideal version of the fundamental lemma, which told us that x plus root minus 5 was the cube of some ideal a. We then noticed that if a is principal, we can just treat it like an element, and after a little bit of algebra, we can see that there are no solutions in this case. But what if it's not? What if we're in the case when a is non-principal? Well, we now have our ideal multiplication table for z adjoin root minus 5. If a is non-principal, then a squared is principal, and so a cubed is non-principal again. But a cubed is generated by the single element x plus root minus 5, and is therefore principal. So this case can't happen. So there are no solutions here either.